Basil's Church on the campus of the University of St. Michael's College in downtown Toronto, the National Catholic Broadcasting Council presents Daily Mass. And greetings and welcome to all of you. The televising of today's Mass is made possible by a contribution from two donors. The first is an anonymous donor from North Bay, Ontario, for the repose of the soul of her husband and other deceased members of her family, and in thanksgiving for the graces and blessings bestowed upon herself and the family. The second is Verna Halgen from Edmonton, Alberta, in memory of and for the repose of the soul of her husband, Paul, and for all the souls in purgatory. May their souls and the souls of all the faithful departed through the mercy of God rest in peace. And so we begin, as we should always begin, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with all of you. Amen. As we stand here this day, we know that we are in the presence of our God, that God is wherever we are. And in God's presence, we acknowledge the gifts that we have received. At the same time, we have to acknowledge that we haven't always lived or expressed our gratitude by the way that we have lived. And so we acknowledge our failure and ask forgiveness of God and of each other. You were sent to heal the contrite of heart. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. And you came to call sinners. Christ, have mercy. You are seated at the right hand of the Father to intercede for us. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sin, and bring us to everlasting life. Amen. And let us pray. Attend to the pleas of your people with heavenly care, O Lord. We, we pray that they may see what must be done and gain strength to do what they have seen. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. A reading from the letter of Paul to the Romans. I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory about to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the children of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not of its own will, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay and will obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning in labor pains until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have, been, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly while we wait for adoption, the redemption of our bodies. For in hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what is seen? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. The word of the Lord. Be to God. The Lord has done great. Done great things for them. The Lord. 
Lord has done great things for us, and we rejoiced. The Lord has done great things for us. Restore our fortunes, O Lord, like the water courses in the desert of the Negev. May those who sow in tears reap with shouts of joy. The Lord has done great things for us. Gospel according to Luke. And Jesus said, What is the kingdom of God like? And to what should I compare it? It's like a mustard seed that someone took and sowed in the garden. It grew and became a tree, and the birds of the air made nests in its branches. And again Jesus said, To what should I compare the kingdom of God? It is like yeast that a woman took and mixed in with three measures of flour until all of it was leavened. And this is the gospel of the Lord. Lord We know that the, the basic message proclaimed by Jesus was the reality of the reign of God. And that message of the good news is filled with many examples taken from the earthiness of the first century Palestine. He spoke of grapes, he spoke of thorn bushes, he spoke of figs and thistles, and in today's gospel, mustard seeds and yeast. Megan McKenna points out that the two images that Jesus gives us of his presence in the world, the kingdom on earth, give us an insight into that reality. It's creative, it's ongoing, but not necessarily always orderly according to human standards or logic. We can imagine a person who planted a mustard seed in a vineyard. It's really going to create havoc among the orderly rows of vines. And as it grows, a small tree is produced And the birds of the air will not only come seeking shelter, but probably eating the grapes as well. We can never understand exactly how the presence of God works, but yet we know and affirm and trust that God is present to us. A person who buries yeast in masses of flour has to work very strenuously to make the mass rise so that it becomes bread. The kingdom of God that is, Jesus' power and presence in the world is like a mustard seed, so tiny at times as to be unnoticed. However, once planted, it can take over an entire field just as it's meant to take over our entire lives and the lives of those around us. It can grow from something very small into something unimaginable, primarily because of God's power. There's a direct link between Jesus' ministry and a future manifestation of the reign of God. That's why the description that St. Paul gives in his letter to Romans is so beautiful. All the earth and all that God has made 
is groaning, groaning in hope, groaning in expectation for what is still to come. We live knowing that the Spirit of God is active in our world and that we who are endowed with the Spirit of Christ are called to continue Jesus' mission on earth. Such is the meaning of the members of the body of Christ. But we know that Jesus never defined the kingdom of God. He described the kingdom in parables, in similes, in concepts like life and glory, joy and light. The best biblical description that we find is given in St. Paul's letter to the Romans, in which he states, the kingdom is not a matter of food and drink, but of justice, joy, and peace. The kingdom is not a matter of whether we get what we'd like to eat or drink. The kingdom is a matter of justice, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. And these are not just feelings or sentiments, but realities that we are called to implement in our world. Justice as a biblical concept could best be translated as right relations, or even better, as life-giving relationships. We are called to live those four relationships with God, with ourselves, with our neighbor, both as individual and as a collective, and above all, not above all, but what I don't want to forget is with creation. We focus often on the first three, but we forget creation. The values by which Jesus lived and died don't seem really to make any sense in our highly technological and competitive society. But his values are not based on the world and its values, but rather on what Jesus calls the kingdom or the reign of God. The reign of God is the inbreaking of God into the world in unexpected places and among undeserving people. The reign of God is centered on the possibility of a new relationship between God, humankind, and all of reality. The ultimate goal of the kingdom is the transformation of all reality. The kingdom of God is the new world, which God is creating today, even now. Jesus is a role model for society, but not society as we know it, but rather a role model for society as God dreams it to be. That's what we are called to continue as part of our mission. But we need to take more seriously our relationship with the earth and the way that we live, our style of life. Almost 25 years ago, Pope John Paul, Pope John Paul II wrote the following. In our time, humans have devastated wooded plains and valleys, polluted the waters, deformed the earth's habitat, made the air unbreathable, upset the hydrological and atmospheric systems, blighted green spaces, implemented uncontrollable forms of industrialization, humiliating, humiliating the earth that is our dwelling. I recently read a beautiful pamphlet put together by a collective in a parish entitled, Why Should We Care About Planet Earth, Our Home? And they asked the following questions, which I repeat for all of us. If people like ourselves do not become more conscious of what is taking place here and now on this earth, who will? If we do not become more responsible or concerned about sustainable resources for the future, who will? If we as Catholics do not recognize that these environmental crises are really religious concerns and give rise to moral issues that call for action, who will? If we do not take active, responsible steps in our own personal lives toward a better care for creation in the future, what kind of an environmental legacy are we leaving for our children, for our grandchildren, and for future generations? A new Canadian publication entitled Living Ecological Justice includes a prayer for all creation written by Archbishop Jim Weisgerber of Winnipeg. And in part, it says, Creator God, we give you thanks for the wonders of our world and our universe. And as we continue to unfold the secrets of creation, 
we are ceaselessly amazed by its beauty and its profound interconnectedness. You have made us, the human family, in your image, with the ability both to understand and to choose. Make us more and more mindful of our call to care for all of creation and help us to respond in gratitude. Please stand and join in prayer. As we gather this day, we remember the, the many people who join us across Canada via television. Many of them have written to us and asked specifically that we remember their intentions. And so this day, we lift up their intentions at this Eucharist, and we offer them, asking that God will hear them and that we certainly lift them up this day as we celebrate the Eucharist. And for them and for those intentions, we pray to the Lord. Lord we pray for each one of us here present this day that we may grow in peace, that we may grow in a conviction and a concern for God's creation, that we can walk together as people who are concerned for the good of our earth and the legacy that we want to leave for all people. And for that, for each of us, we pray to the Lord. Lord. We pray in a very special way for people in war-torn war zones in our world, for people who experience injustice, for people who experience repression, for all of those people that they may know the reign of God, peace and justice. For all of them, we pray to the Lord. And all of this we ask through Christ our Lord. And blessed are you, Lord God of all creation, for through your goodness we have received the bread we offer you, fruit of the earth and the work of human hands. It will become for us the bread of life. And blessed are you, Lord God of all creation, for through your goodness we have received the wine we offer you, fruit of the vine and work of human hands. It will become our spiritual drink. Pray, my brothers and sisters, that my sacrifice and yours may become acceptable to God the Father Almighty. And may your people's oblation, O Lord, find favor with you, we pray, that it may restore us to holiness and obtain what we devoutly entreat. And we ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. And the Lord be with you. And be Lift up your hearts. And, and let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and just. It's truly right and just, our duty and our salvation, always and everywhere, to give you thanks, Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Eternal God, through Christ our Lord. His death we celebrate in love. His resurrection we confess with living faith, and his coming in glory we await with unwavering hope. And so with all the angels and saints we praise you, as without end we acclaim.
You are indeed holy, O Lord, the fount of all holiness. Make holy, therefore, these gifts, we pray, by sending down your Spirit upon them like the dewfall, so that they may become for us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. At the time he was betrayed and entered willingly into his passion, he took bread and giving thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice and once more giving thanks, he gave it to his disciples saying, take this all of you and drink from it. For this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in memory of me. The mystery of faith. When we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim your death, O Lord, until you come again. And therefore, as we celebrate the memorial of his death and resurrection, we offer you, Lord, the bread of life and the chalice of salvation, giving thanks that you have held us worthy to stand in your presence and serve you. Humbly we pray that partaking of the body and blood of Christ, we may be gathered into one by the Holy Spirit. Remember, Lord, your church spread throughout the world and bring her to the fullness of charity together with Francis, our Pope, Thomas, our Bishop, and the entire church. Remember also our brothers and sisters who have fallen asleep in the hope of the resurrection and all who have died in your mercy. Welcome them into the light of your face. Have mercy on us all, we pray, that with the blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, blessed Joseph, her spouse, with the blessed apostles and all the saints who have pleased you throughout the ages, we may merit to be co-heirs to eternal life and may praise and glorify you through your Son, Jesus Christ. For it is through him, with him, and in him, O God Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. Amen. And faithful to the teaching of Jesus, we pray just as he taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And deliver us, Lord, we pray from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days that by the help of your mercy, we may always be free from sin and safe from all distress as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And Lord Jesus Christ, you said to your apostles, my peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. And may the peace of the Lord be with you always. And let us offer to each other a sign of that peace.
Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. And blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should come under my roof, but only say the word and my soul shall be healed. With those of you at home, join with me in this admonition of St. Augustine. Therefore, once and for all, this short command is given to you. Love and do what you will. If you keep silent, keep silent by love. If you speak, speak by love. If you correct, correct by love. If you pardon, pardon by love. Let love be rooted in you, and from the root, nothing but good can grow. And let us pray. Humbly we ask you, Almighty God, be graciously pleased to grant that those you renew with your sacraments may also serve with lives pleasing to you. And we ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. And the Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And let us go in the peace of Christ, glorifying the Lord by our lives. Have a good day. Our thanks to two donors. The first is an anonymous donor from North Bay, Ontario. The second is Verna Haljan from Edmonton, Alberta. And it's their generous contributions that made the televising of today's Mass possible. Our prayer book costs $10, and if you'd like to order it, send a check or a money order payable to the NCBC. And mail it to the NCBC, 21 Dunlop Street, Suite 100, Richmond Hill, Ontario, L4C, 2M6.